Good morning. It's nice to see everyone. I hope it has been a nice Easter morning so far. I wasn't sure how many people would show up, but according to my screen, there's like 74 people here, so that's pretty good. Feels like a nice, uh, nice group. So I heard recently from some friends of mine at Aranya Bodhi, which is a um, vihara for nuns on the Sonoma coast. And they had noticed that a, a bird called a hermit thrush uh, was not present for them during their last um, rains retreat sometime last year. They just didn't hear this bird and they had normally been hearing it of course, I think they would be interested in a bird called a hermit thrush. So that's maybe something that was, uh, you know, on their in their attention. But they wondered if maybe it was due to climate change because it seems to come when there was some um, cool mist in the forest and they hadn't had that that year. Um, but just recently on retreat, the abbess of Aranya Bodhi uh, noticed that the mists had returned and that they could hear once again this. Um, this hermit thrush bird. So I thought I would play a little clip of what these sound like. I don't know if this is gonna come through on the sound, but we're gonna try it. It's pretty high pitched. Yeah, I see some nods. Pretty cool, huh? The forest was alive with these sounds. Very beautiful. So one website calls the hermit thrush an ethereal singer as the, as the sound for it. So I think this is just one of many ways, uh, some welcome and some not, that the future is turning out to be unpredictable for us. <laughs> Things are happening maybe differently than we expected. So today being Easter, I, I kind of wanted to weave a bunch of things together. Um, you know, there's birds, which reminds me of eggs. Uh, there's new beginnings in the spring. There's, of course, the very human tendency to think about the future, which is often what happens in this time of year. It's natural that we start thinking forward. So these are all things that come about at this time. And when we think about this, beginnings, eggs, the future, it is uh, maybe possible to have the thought that the future has really changed, <laughs> hasn't it? Or has it? You know, did the future ever exist, really, except maybe in our minds? So we're seeing some of that. We're starting to have an impact of that on our system. So it is normal for humans to be able to project forward into the future and have an idea about how things are going to flow. That is one of our abilities of the human mind. And so it's normal and, and fine to be doing that. Um, but it's important that we relate to that skillfully. You know, we relate to our ability to imagine the future and try to bring it about in a way that doesn't bring suffering for us. And that's um, maybe something that we have to learn over time as we kind of work with our, our own mind and our tendencies and also with, of course, the way the external world flows which is not always as we expect. So this is, of course, this is talked about in the Buddhist teachings in a number of different ways. Uh, the Buddha knew that people have this capacity to try to imagine things or aim toward things, and he wanted them to use that in a skillful way. So one of the ways that he talked about it was in how we walk our path, you know, our tendency to have goals or decide that we want certain things or that we want to let go of certain things that we're quote unquote working on certain things as we see in our mind that we want to change them. Um, and so he, he had some comments about this. He had some teachings and we'll go over a little bit of that today. And I'm going to make the suggestion that uh, the way that we relate to our spiritual practice and how we think about ourselves and working on our heart or our relationships or the other things that we do is similar to the way we walk through life in general and the way that we think about 
the future of our job or other things that we're planning for our retirement. Um, that these are all just kind of activities where we uh, project forward how we want things to go and try to move toward them. So these are similar kinds of you know, ways that we approach things. So let's see what we can learn. There are ways to practice in which we aim toward a certain result. And there are also modes of practice where the main aim is to be in the present moment and just uh, try to be as close as we can to the present and not think about the past and the future. Um, these would be more things where we're trying to be with unfolding experience without clinging, for example. So following this kind of immediate way of practicing can allow the path to unfold in ways that we wouldn't expect and sometimes to go much farther than we would expect uh, compared to something where we're imagining something in the future that we're aiming toward, which is an okay way to practice, but then we're limited by what we can imagine. <laughs> and some of us may have experience with things happening that are not what we could have imagined. <laughs> so we understand maybe intuitively that our imagination doesn't always encompass all the possibilities. So we can explore that a bit. There's a simile um, used a number of times in the suttas that uh, came to mind as I was thinking about this for today. And it's a sutta of a hen sitting, uh, it's a simile of a hen sitting on her eggs, nurturing her eggs so that they'll hatch. And it's pointed out that her kind of future-oriented wishes for her chicks are less important compared with whether or not she's properly incubating them. So here's how, the, here's how the simile goes. I'm going to read. Suppose a hen has eight, 10, or 12 eggs. If she doesn't cover them rightly, warm them rightly, or incubate them rightly, then even though this wish may occur to her, oh, that my chicks might break through the eggshells with their spiked claws or beaks and hatch out safely, still, it is not possible that the chicks will break through the eggshells with their spiked claws or beaks and hatch out safely. Why is that? Because the hen has not covered them rightly, warmed them rightly, or incubated them rightly. And then you get the converse. You know, suppose a hen has eight, 10, or 12 eggs, and she does cover them rightly, warm them rightly, and incubate them rightly. Even though this wish may not occur to her, oh, that my chicks might break through the eggshells with their spiked claws and beaks and hatch out safely. Still, it is possible that the chicks will do that. Why is that? Because the hen has covered them, warmed them, and incubated them rightly. So it's a kind of a simple um, analogy, maybe simpler than, than our own life, but nonetheless, we get the point, which is that it's not so much about what we want, but more about what we do. And there's a sense that if we, um, rather than having some future goal that we wish for, or, or um, we can nurture instead what I would like to call the process of the path. So we have um, kind of a process that we're undergoing or going through or participating in in some way, such as having eggs that we're waiting to have hatch. And so um, that's where the focus is, is on doing that well, essentially. And I would say that linking it to the life process of chickens and eggs, which probably even in ancient India, there was the idea of the chicken and the egg. I'm projecting a little bit, but uh, by linking it to a natural life process, we get the sense that this is a natural process, that we're engaged in something that is something like a, a process we'd see in nature. Often another one that's used is a tree growing, you know, a seed growing into a tree. Um, and so we, we try to imagine instead of our little individual life proceeding in an external world and trying to make it be a certain way, can we rest more in the idea that there's some kind of a process going on that we get to participate in or that we can choose to tune into? And then, then it has a different feeling, how we would walk our path and also how we would approach our, our life in general. Um, so as often happens in the suttas, an image that's given, like this hen image, is followed by an application of the image to Dharma practice. Um, 
So, the Buddha says, even though this wish may occur to a practitioner who dwells without devoting herself to development, oh, that my mind might be released from suffering through lack of clinging. Still, their mind is not released from suffering through lack of clinging. Why is that? Because of lack of development. And then the inverse, even though this wish may not occur to a practitioner who dwells devoting herself to development, oh, that my mind might be released from suffering through lack of clinging, still her mind is released from suffering through lack of clinging. And why is that? Due to development. So again, we have this idea that it kind of doesn't matter whether you want awakening or not. It's more if the practices are done. Um, so, developing what, one can also ask, it just says due to development, or the person dwells developing their mind. Um, different suttas give different answers, but they're all variations on the same theme of walking the Eightfold Path. You know, in some way, if we're engaged in the practices that are given about meditation, about ethical conduct, about learning to see such that uh, we're seeing wisely, these kinds of practices will have a natural result in the mind becoming more free over time. And it's more important that we do that than we sit and wish, oh, I wish I could be free, I wish I could be free. It's extremized a little bit here, of course, but um, I think the intention is clear, is that this moment matters. So uh, it's also important to do things well, or you know, the, the texts say rightly, but we might just say well or skillfully or wholesomely, something like that. So it's not quite that just anything will work, uh, only certain things will work. And uh, you know, the Buddha does give a wide range of instructions and we can study those and figure out which ones seem, uh, seem to work well for us. So, we can also um, reflect uh, how poorly we tend to predict the future. So going again to this idea of how do I relate to my thoughts about the future? Uh, I remember actually Gil saying that one of the things that where he eventually let go so much of planning and trying to predict was when he started actually tabulating how good his record was at being able to know what was gonna come next or how things were gonna unfold. And um, the reality is that we're not that good at it on certain scales. Okay, we can predict that, you know, we can predict certain things like um, maybe sort of due to memory, like I'm probably pretty good at predicting what's in my refrigerator. I won't get all of it, but some of it because I remember because I put it in there. But um, as far as, you know, how things are going to go in the world tomorrow, it's not so good. And also thinking about, you know, how a certain situation is going to turn out I'm often surprised, you know, when I'm dealing with other folks or uh, so forth that, you know, things go differently than I expect, often, you know, sometimes in really good and surprising ways. So I, I found that, me too, I'm finding that it's possible to let go of my tendency to think I can predict and plan and control these sorts of things, maybe in a more uh, metaphorical or beautiful sense, we can imagine some images, like an image from nature. Caterpillars aren't very good at predicting what a, they're going to be in terms of a butterfly. You know, it's like that probably isn't in the mind of the caterpillar. It's hard to, I don't know, I don't know what's in a caterpillar's mind, but I don't think they really know uh, what that's going to be when they're going into the chrysalis or the cocoon. And then in a more, you know, human world example, I remember a, a wonderful quote from a Zen teacher, uh, Misha Merrill, um, who was talking about how we don't really know how our life is going to unfold. And she said, uh, you may think you're going to be a chocolate cake, but then you turn out to be a steak. <laughs> and it was quite amusing because, of course, there's a lot of vegetarians, especially in the Zen world, right? And so it can be maybe disturbing if you turn out to be a steak when you thought you were going to be a chocolate cake. So there are ways in which practice unfolds and even turns us into things that we uh, didn't expect. <laughs> and so uh, in the same way, and yet you'll deal with it, right? You know, you'll, you'll probably be a good steak. So I would encourage all of us to be good at 
whatever we're becoming in this current situation. And of course, the Buddha had a more uh, general and um, equanimous way of saying it. He said in the suttas, however people conceive it, it is ever other than that. <laughs> Does that sound familiar at this time? However we conceive it, it's ever other than that. So the future, I think, is sort of one of these concepts is that our ordinary mind likes ideas and plans and predictions and structure. And this is fine, um, but invariably it's limiting because it tends to work within what is already known. We try so hard to engineer the future, but in reality, um, things are proceeding according to conditions that we can't see all of. So then what, you know, what is this more skillful approach to uh, somehow getting from here into the future, getting from now into the next week or month or the things that we're going to have to do in our life? So, um, you know, maybe a more reliable approach is to sense in the present moment what is happening and move forward from there. So that's what I want to kind of focus on as we go forward. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said, to take care of the future, take care of the present. There's something very profound about that. Uh, it sounds almost simple, um, too simple, but it really brings us right into this moment and it's easy to forget. But it essentially says, if we get from this moment to the next moment, you know, we take care of this present moment, then we arrive in kind of the best place that we could in the next moment. And then if we do the same thing, we see where we are then, and we take care of that present moment and go forward, uh, then we'll get into the, the best possible version of the next future moment. So, and so, and so it goes. So, you know, when things feel very uncertain, it can be very skillful to bring the mind into this very moment and just focus on getting from here to the next moment, doing it well. And what does well mean? Could mean calmly, kindly, peacefully, mindfully, you know, things that are in line with what we're developing in ourselves, what we're valuing. Just do this and then the next and then the next. I have a friend <clears throat> who is a very planning oriented person and she said that um, for a while, her practice consisted simply of doing everything, and these are her words, quietly and well. And as I reflected on that, I thought that's a really good approach. If we could just do the things in our life quietly and well <clears throat> for a while, that would be really good. There's a, um, at the retreat center in IMS, at IMS, which is in uh, Western Massachusetts. There's a picture on the wall outside the area, <clears throat> excuse me, that has the interview rooms. And it's a picture, it's one of those Japanese ink drawings, you know, maybe the ones where you use a straw and kind of chase the ink up the page. And it looks like it's kind of a picture of a plant or something at the bottom. Um, and then it has some little stalks growing, maybe the way stalks shoot up in the spring. And some of them are kind of short. And then there's, um, there's one that goes all the way up about six feet. It's a huge, you know, long, uh, tall drawing and very narrow. And there's a plant at the bottom. And then it has one of these stalks chasing all the way up the page. And the caption on it says something like, try not to have any expectations. And I think it's um, a quite an appropriate analogy for practice and maybe also for life, the way if we just um, kind of stay with the present moment and follow it along, it might just go and go and go in some direction and um, kind of shoot up into one of these tall flower stalks. So I'm not, of course, trying to imply a guaranteed a rosy future from things that are happening right now. I think there will be a lot of problems and there already are. But nonetheless, I would still suggest that we don't really know and that there is tremendous potential. Uh, and one of the best things that we can do is simply to do this moment well. What can I do right now to make this moment ethical, kind, gentle, 
mindful, wise, whatever feels appropriate for the moment. Just reflecting this way throughout the day really can bring the mind back home to a feeling of being at home and just doing the practice, doing this moment. A lot of our spiritual path is actually about tuning into the voice that we have in our heart, you know, the orientation that we have right here inside of us. And it's not a voice that we can hear easily because we have so many things coming in from the outside and already so much conditioning that's been put into our mind from other people or from our society that we can't so easily hear uh, the very immediate voice in our own heart. And as you know, maybe at these days when we're somewhat more quiet, I don't know that your household is literally quiet, or we at least do have less stimulation coming directly from our external world activities. It may be an opportunity to tune into that voice that's in our own heart that we each have and see if we're willing to open to it and trust it. And it's something that we can hear long before awakening. That's not at all a necessity. And we can, we can maybe begin to place some of our trust in that inner quality. And it's the same for life in the world. The way that we go forward moment to moment can come from this voice. Even if we're expressing externally, deal, you know, having relationships in our family world every day, you know, they call this isolation, but you may not be isolated at all. You may have a lot of people at home um, and that's fine. But we can start to maybe have some of this inner orientation as we go about our relationships from moment to moment. So the Buddha suggests in a teaching that simple awareness is um, of this moment is one way that we can go, uh, that we can navigate. So this is a, a teaching called A Single Excellent Night, and I'm just going to read part of the verse from that teaching. Let not a person revive the past or on the future build her hopes, for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, with insight, let her see each presently arisen state. Let her know that and be sure of it, invincibly unshakably. This teaching appears four times in a series in the Majjhima Nikaya, and the context is often that someone is trying to remember it. You know, they'll say, oh, I heard that I'm supposed to remember this teaching about the single excellent night, and sometimes the scene is that they ask somebody, do you remember that teaching? The other person says, I don't remember that teaching. Do you remember it? And so there's kind of a sense that it's actually a teaching that that might be worth memorizing. And I, I know a teacher who um, encourages people to memorize it in the first person as a little internal instruction, uh, which I have done. And I, I'll, I'll read it at the beginning part in the first person because it, I think it makes a helpful instruction, something that you might wish to, to bear in mind. Let me not revive the past or on the future build my hopes, for the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. Instead, let me see with insight each presently arisen state. Let me know that and be sure of it, invincibly, unshakably. So the past has been left behind and the future has not been reached. There's just this moment, the moment when we can hear what's going on in our heart, and we can respond to people around us in a way that's kind, clear, wise, peaceful, gentle. And maybe if we do so, we'll hear this voice of the hermit thrush on these lovely spring days that we're enjoying. So thank you. And if we 
do have a few minutes. If anybody has any uh, questions, you'd be welcome to unmute yourself. Um, there's so many, I can't see all of you on my screen. So you would need to unmute. There are a few chats coming in. Could I say which sutta the metaphor is from? Oh, that's probably the, probably the hen sutta. Um, so that's from, there's several places. Uh, Samyutta Nikaya 22.101 or MN 53. Those would be good places to look, those two. And the uh, single excellent night is MN 131. All right, have a good morning. Happy Easter. Be well.